Hello. On behalf of the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, Jonathan O'Day, I'd like to welcome you to the Lower House of Australia's oldest parliament, the Parliament of New South Wales. We meet today on Gadigal land, the Gadigal clan of the Eora Nation through their kinship ties with all that is on the land, in the sea and in the air, have been caring for this country for thousands and thousands of years and we pay respect to their elders. This chamber, the Legislative Assembly, is colloquially known as the Bear Pit. It's the place where premiers are made and unmade, where some of the fiercest political debates have taken place in this nation's history. But there's another side to politics as well. There's the collegial engagement between members of parliament that takes place away from this arena of theatre, in which they make policy, in which they care for the interests of the public of New South Wales. On this day, World Parliament Day, I'm joined by six panellists to talk about ethics and politics. Four of them are senior politicians and two of them are serving journalists. Laura Jays is a political journalist with Sky News Australia. She's joined by Kerry Chikorovsky, who is now in business but was formerly the first woman to lead a political party in New South Wales and served as a minister in various coalition governments. Bob Carr was New South Wales' longest serving Premier and having left this parliament, went on to be a senator and then was appointed as Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs and now serves as an academic working at the University of Technology, Sydney. He's joined by another former Premier, Nick Greiner, who headed a Liberal government and has since had a distinguished career in business and now serves still in politics but on this occasion as the Federal President of the Liberal Party of Australia. Sandra Norrie, who was a minister in the Labor government and is now on a number of boards in the community area, notably as deputy chair of the Duke of Edinburgh program. And last but not least, Peter Harcher, a Gold Walkley Award winning journalist who is both the international and political editor at the Sydney Morning Herald. As is the way in this place, we're going to have a series of questions which will be posed by members and now let's get on with the conversation about ethics in politics. And so I'd like to call upon now for the first question, the Nationals member for Port Macquarie, Leslie Williams. Well, thank you very much and a very warm welcome to all our panellists. Uh, so the first question for you is, um, is a life in politics possible for every citizen? Mm. Sandra Nori, if I could begin with you, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of coming into politics when you first arrived and what was possible for an ordinary citizen to do in this place? Um, well, the short answer is no, I don't think it's for everybody, not for a country mile. You're sitting over there where that, our friend is sitting over there. And I looked around and even though I knew the numbers were 107, nine females, when I got in here, I really was still shocked at all the grey suits. You were sitting there prim and proper. Bob was in front of me. Um, so things have... Things, thankfully, things have changed. A um, couple of things about what made my time here very difficult. Two young kids got divorced very early, so I was effectively a single mum, mm. even though their dad was very good, but he was a senator. So there were times when it was just a nightmare for me. The day that Bill Beckroche came up to me at four o'clock and says, Thursday, normally get up at quarter past four, says, we're going till 6.30. I said, but I've got to pick the kids up at quarter past six at the kindy. And there was just nothing. So, you know, anyway, luckily, luckily my mum, who used to save John's bacon and mine, who saved two people's careers in Parliament, mum, after yelling at me, what kind of a job have you got for a mother? <laughs> <laughs> but the Senate was sitting. She wasn't going to yell that at John, but anyway. Mm. OK, no, not everyone can be because you have to be prepared to do a lot of things that are most people and probably most sane people wouldn't do. You do have to put your family about 10th, about 10th, they don't get a choice. Um, you have to be dogged. You have to be prepared to hit your head up against a brick wall. And especially going forward now, where the problems that face society are long-term, but you're dealing with a human primate who has a brain that's literally hardwired for the short term. Mm. Try and tell people, to do, we're going to do this so that in 50 or 60, it's not, going, it's not going to happen. You have to be prepared to just keep hitting your head up against a brick wall uh, and, and 
putting your case. I think you have to be pro-social in your outlook and devise policies that are pro-social. Just explain what you mean by pro-social. Pro-social is basically saying you recognise that it's not all about the individual, that we owe society something, we have to do some things for the good of society, which is why I'm so involved with the Duke of Edinburgh Award because it's creating pro-social citizens, but I'll give a plug for that later. <laughs> um, you must be someone who can't be stuck in ideological purity. It's about outcomes. You must resist the urge that a lot of politicians will not do, and I don't criticise the major parties for this, but you should not be a politician that says oh, either implicitly or explicitly, I'm not really a politician. I find that the most egregious lie that well, let's can, unpack that can be peddled <laughs> in politics. So basically, unless you've got that old Bentham utilitarianism approach of create all the happiness you can and remove all the difficulties you can, you really shouldn't be here. Le le yeah. Thanks for that. Now, Nick, were you conscious of all the grey suits and maybe a different set of opportunities for men and women when you came in? Well, uh, it was a long time ago, almost 40, actually 40 years ago next month. Uh, I think Bob was already here showing with no, I wasn't. <laughs> Rewriting re history. Of course, of course I am. I wrote about you in the Bulletin <laughs> magazine. <laughs> um, Simon, um, <clears throat> of course, parliaments ultimately reflect society. I mean, I, uh, I was a Hungarian of Catholic with a trace of Jewish background, lived on the North Shore. Uh, at that time, the number of Catholics in the Liberal Party was very few. Uh, that changed dramatically even over the time, the 12 years I was here. But parliaments, I think, naturally and appropriately change to reflect the society. Mm. Now, I think what is, uh, what is happening now and what ought to happen is um, a continuation of that trend. Yeah, there need to be not just uh, more women, especially on the centre-right side of politics, mm. but there need to be more people to reflect the ethnic makeup of the community uh, and, and so on. So it needs to be broadly representative. But back in, uh, back in 1980, uh, <laughs> It wasn't an issue that was front of mind other than perhaps uh, when I was, I ran in a by-election to get elected and I was putting out my billboard of beautiful picture of a much younger Nick <laughs> and a little old lady came up to me uh, and said, oh, is this the new man looking at the picture of myself? Yeah. And uh, I said, yes, yes, it is. And she said, is he one of us? <laughs> and uh, I, I have a notion that she had a fairly restricted view on, <laughs> at Taramurra in uh, 1980 as to what one of us meant. What did you uh, say? Yeah, of course. I, I, oh, I said Excellent definite, chat. definitely, yeah. definitely. Kerry, yeah, did you relate to what Sandra was saying about that? I know you started up the different part of the parliament, up the yep. back up there. Yep. Um, well, look, I, just to answer your question, before I get to what Sandra said, um, some years ago when I was a minister, I had a young, um, a young student come in to do work experience with me. And I think she kind of summed it up because your question was, can anyone be a parliamentarian? Mm. And she had to fill in a form afterwards. And the first question on the form was, what qualifications do you need for this job? And she wrote, none. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was most offended. And I said, what do you mean, none? And she said, well, there's no formal qualifications you need. There is nothing that you can point to specifically mm. as a job description, as the skills you need. And I said, but, you know, I've got to be able to speak and all this. She said, yeah, but they're the things you've learnt. And she said, to actually put your hand up to be a politician, there's really nothing, there's no qualification. Now, that ignores the practical reality of being able to get elected or pre-selected and then elected. Mm. So you have to be a member of a political party. So my view... One of the things you need, and I would endorse this with what Sandra has said, one of the things you need is clearly you need a passion. You absolutely need a passion for this job yeah. because if you go into it half-hearted, you are going to be completely overwhelmed by it. Um, I do remember walking into this place the very first day I was here, and I won't name anyone, but one of my new colleagues came up to me and said, oh, you know, how are you finding it? I said, oh, it's been the most fantastic experience because you know, my story is I only got pre-selected very quickly and so I really didn't know the electorate. So I'd spent the time from being elected to coming here, walking around the electorate, going around, introducing myself to the shopkeepers and mm. people in the street and all that sort of stuff. And I said, I really love being out in the electorate. And he shook his head and said, oh, the worst part of this job is having to talk to people. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, do you think you're in the right job? <laughs> yeah, so right. I do think there's a passion. I think you need to have a commitment. You need to, these days, even more than we were there, be very conscious of what the public 
um, the public life is because, you know, I joke yeah. that we used to be able to go home on the weekend, but nowadays it doesn't matter. You go home on the weekend, you go take the kids for a walk, someone's got a camera, they take a photo, say, I saw Kerry out with the kids now. Didn't happen in our time, not yeah. to that extent, but now it's a very, very public life. So I, I think yeah. the biggest thing you need, the most important thing I think you need is a tough hide. <laughs> I also wonder, I mean, if the question is, is it possible for everyone? And just, Bob, there are probably people, if they're watching this now or later, who might say, actually, there's no chance for me to really have a life in politics. They may have been deprived of a, a really good education. They may have grown up in an area where they've had some marginalisation in terms of opportunities more generally, let alone going into politics. I mean, should, should everybody, if they want to, seriously aspire to be able to enter into politics? Oh, yes. And I, I think there's a, a lot that's encouraging about it. When I give advice to youngsters, I say, think of location. If you're on the Labor side of politics, don't live in the, <laughs> in the eastern suburbs and the North Shore, all the, all the attractive places by some <laughs> test. Um, you're going to live somewhere, move to Sydney's Greater West, where population growth is going to be delivering more seats and creating opportunities. Mm. Um, I say to you, the youngsters who come and see me, look, join the party, join the party of your choice. Some of them might be from conservative backgrounds and set yourself in an area, set yourself up in an area where you might win a seat and then come back and I'll do a bit of mentoring. But I'm wasting, wasting my time talking to you now when you pay no attention the location and the possible career path. Mm. I think I think Nick's Nick's election was very significant. I know I know a bit about New South Wales political history, <laughs> and his side of politics was imbued, mm. imbued, thinking of the 50s here, still into the 60s, with an Anglican Presbyterian mm. Masonic yeah. ethos. Anti-Catholicism was, at some level below the surface, still simmering away. Um, I'd say this about, about Nick. The fact that the conservative side of New South Wales politics turned to a Hungarian migrant boy with a bit of Jewish heritage said a lot about him, but about the capacity of Australian politics to grow and change. Mm. Just one other thing I'd throw in. I, I got elected in 83. You cannot overlook the extent to which the ethos of this place was a boys' boarding school. <laughs> this, this chamber. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, 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 the parliament, the parliamentary institution, members of the state, uh, mem members of the lower and the upper house. Mm. And it was a level of humour and the approach to things that I think demeaned it a great deal. There were too few women and the flavour <laughs> was all wrong. It was hard to have a serious about, say, uh, some of them, uh, the ethical or, or moral questions without the stupidest mm. schoolboy humour intruding. And I'll give you one example. It's, a, it's an absurd example, but I was a young reformist, uh, Minister for Environment and Planning, and I was sponsoring legislation to declare illegal to outlaw dolphinariums in New South Wales. It was something that had caught my attention. Well, talking about this in the party room was a bit of a challenge. I remember <laughs> someone, it might have been my beloved friend, Mike Cleary, yelled at, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. You know, Marine Mammals Protection Act. Is this, is this got a, our seal of approval? <laughs> uh, so, so, and then there was a dissent. But I did notice that the half dozen women members of the caucus were seriously entertaining a discussion about what cruelty to other species meant mm. and that it did have an ethical dimension. The women were engaged and everything I saw as women increased their representation in these chambers in the years since confirmed that the level of debate and the maturity of the discourse was enhanced. So you've talked about change and we've had a question from Jenny who's saying, well, what needs further to change to ensure that we get more of the diversity of this state represented in mm. places like this? Um, Laurie, you, you've been an astute observer of politics. What do you, do you think? Well, this comes back to the quotas versus targets argument in many ways. And I think quotas, there is some evidence of them working, particularly in the Labor Party at a federal level, but I also see it as um, setting women up to fail in, in many ways. It's great to have a quota in place and we can see that uh, in producing the, the numbers of women on the Labor side in, in the Chamber, in Canberra, when you look at it like this, but um, what about all the infrastructure set up 
to actually allow women to have children, have families and also have a political career. Going back to the original question, is it for everyone? Well, no, there are sacrifices. And I think I can say I'm part of a, a generation. Am I still a millennial? I don't know. But, um, but we do think we can have it all. Um, and it's not just a career in politics, it's a, it's a career per se, but it, there's a partnership that comes with that and things do have to give. So when it comes back to supporting women in politics, um, I think, yeah, quotas are great, but where's the infrastructure every single step along the way to ensure that you can do that? Um, I think the, uh, the expectations of our politicians uh, these days are far too high. The amount of time spent in Canberra, away from your family, uh, away from your electorate, and then when you're back in the electorate, the party fundraisers, uh, as Kerry touched upon, the, the public events you're expected to go to, and then, you know, you're expected to be an absolute clean skin when every single aspect of your life is now there for public consumption. Uh, so perhaps our expectations, as you know, I say us in terms of, yes, a little bit of media and the public, are too high and um, and, and the, the uh, productivity of our politicians, what is expected of them is too high. So look, I, I agree with Nick, the parliament reflects broader society, but I would say parliament drags its feet a bit. Uh, the corporate world is, is keeping up a, a yeah. bit a bit. I think up. a number of these issues are going to come out with some of these other questions. I'm going to move on to the next one. This is going to be posed by Nationals member for Cootamundra, Steph Cook. Thank you very much. Is civility in Parliament and in public life more generally compatible with winning? <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Peter, on this. Again, you've also been watching Parliament and, I mean, it can be a very aggressive game and some people think you've got to play hard to win and it's all about that ultimately. So this question about balancing with civility, do you see that as possible? I see it as possible and I see it modelled. Um, there are, I think there are plenty of politicians. Now, this is not going to get me a lot of uh, votes with the uh, larger voting Australian public, but I think there are lots of politicians who manage to be civil and effective uh, and get ahead. Um, OK, um, one politician who came to mind, a federal politician, as we were actually we were having the previous discussion about diversity, uh, a minority upon a minority upon a minority, uh, is a senator called Penny Wong. Uh, Penny, okay, she's a woman. Uh, she's a lesbian. She's uh, Malaysian Chinese, Chinese Malaysian, and she's from South Australia. <laughs> I mean, how much more minority oh, can I you was get? Wondering if he was going to touch on South Australia. Australia. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, and yet, um, sh uh, yet she's managed not only to become, uh, you know, a very senior figure uh, in federal politics, but she's a very civil, uh, very capable and very pleasant person, as well as being highly effective. And she doesn't draw on any, she doesn't make any claims on any of her minority statuses mm. uh, to get ahead, but she's civil, she's effective, it is possible. Yeah. Okay. What about public yeah, civility and private civility? I think the two probably different things, Peter, right? Public civility and private civility. Yeah. Some politicians are very civil in public, but they're ruthless uh, in private. And, and I was going to ask about that because, I mean, I imagine that there are all sorts of opportunities that politicians have. I'll put this to you, Kerry, uh, where you could take advantage, if you like, of the private failings of an opponent and you could secure a win. I'm just wondering how you all decide where the boundaries are to be drawn as to what you just wouldn't do you know, if somebody gives you a dossier or a file or something that a person in their private life? Well, I've actually had, I had an example of that um, when I was leader, which I won't go into because I didn't do it then and I'm not going to do it now, but it was a discussion which, I mean, the, the real issue for me around it was I was being asked to pursue something on behalf of someone who I felt was really struggling. The person was struggling and they had a beef against a particular politician. And... I kept, what, what was playing in my mind was how is this going to help this particular individual? Mm. Um, yeah, it would have been a big political score, but at the end of the day, I'm thinking it's not worth it for that individual involved. They thought they wanted revenge, and I'd had the opportunity because I could stood up, stand up in this place and say whatever I liked. Were you criticised for not taking up? The um, there was. I kept it pretty tight, so the yeah. only the people in my office actually knew about that particular circumstance. Um, let me put it this way, though. Um, in the Me Too era, I probably would have, nowadays, it would probably be almost 
um, obligatory for me to make it public, but mm. at those st at that time it wasn't. Mm. So I think, yeah, there are t you know you've got to make you've got to have a judgment call about things, and there are times when you you just can't do things. But but back to the point about just the women and the you know, um, I one of the reasons that so apparently I got rid of I was written, my, oh my colleagues voted me out. Do we all remember that? Oh, I do certainly. <laughs> um, one of the reasons they voted me out was because I wasn't aggressive enough. Yeah. I wasn't right. aggressive enough in the parliament. Um, I didn't stand at that box and pound my fist. And I remember saying to them, the problem for a woman is if I do that, you'll all call me a bitch. Yeah, you yeah. know, and the public will call me a bitch. So I think, I'm hoping, Simon, I really hope that it's not like that in Canberra now for women. I watch, I watch parliament a lot. I think that there is a greater civility, particularly for the women, because I don't think they need to do that. But yeah, it, it's, it's tough. It, it has improved, tough. but it's still there, right? Yeah. Laura, would you, I mean, the kind, if the kind of information, as a journalist, if mm. information comes to you of the kind that Kerry received and said, I'm just not going to use it because mm. it's not right, do you have the same kind of criteria that you're using as well? Uh, absolutely. Not? Yeah. And How do you decide? It's a, well, it's personal integrity uh, and basic journalistic principles, I think, but there's a lot of rumour. Uh, there is a lot of um, information that's given to you. Uh, in a formal and informal way um, that you could either use or, or, or not use. Um, but, you know, you're playing with people's lives in, in some senses. And Barnaby Joyce, um, I think we all have an opinion on whether that should or, or shouldn't have been uh, made public, whether it affected his role as a Deputy Prime Minister, whether he should have lost his job for it. Um, you know, <coughs> there's so many different aspects to all of that. But in the end, as a journalist, you um, make a decision as with your own personal kind of moral, ethical criteria and, you know, going back to those basic principles. I don't know whether I would have, for example, the Barnaby Joyce example, whether I would have published that story, uh, but I know it wouldn't have been a story without the photograph um, and then, you know, pursuing the photograph is a whole different uh, set of... Uh, ethical questions I guess you could have. Oh, you, you trained as a journalist, you worked as a journalist, so there's this fine distinction to be made between what the public is interested in and what is in the public interest. And do you think that that distinction is mm. being adequately applied no. today in journalism, but also in politics, when people start to think about, well, I could secure this, you know, I've heard some people, I remember, I won't say who it was, interviewing a very um, senior Labor politician who basically argued that the ends justify the means if only we could have power, we could do all this good. So anything that we do in order to secure power will be to the advantage of the nation. And so it was rationalised in that sense to some degree. There's no easy answer. This is the, this is the age old challenge of, the, uh, of having a system in which political power is contested by some means or another. Um, going back to Aristotle, people would have been weighing these considerations. To reduce it to a very practical level, if you're an opposition leader especially, you're likely to have the occasional visit from someone who's got a shock horror story um, about individuals on the other side. Not a lot, I've got to say. Not a lot. But as Peter Collins, uh, one of their colleagues, said to me, you know, people would come to him and say, I can tell you for sure, Neville Rann owns the Double Bay Hotel. <laughs> he said, well, look, you bring me back the details and I might do something with it. And it just fades away. And again and again, I think every now and then, I think I'm not, I'm not overstating it, but every now and then a, pol a political leader's in that position of saying, well, you might be right, but does it matter? Does it matter? Yeah. And can we really press this sort of questionable stuff to advantage? Is there a care for each other, Sandra? I mean, in, when you were here, did, did people actually, away from the theatre, of question time, yes. look, look after each I other? I certainly got phone calls from all sorts of people on this side of the house. When Michael Yabsley, who, with whom I've kissed and made up, right? <laughs> Pre-COVID. Uh, <laughs> had a really bad shot at me one day and it, and it really hurt and because it was very sensitive and I got phone calls from all over the place. Yes, there, there is. There is, there, is a, there is a caring. Look, uh, in terms of the, the general question, it's a cliche, but really, I think you've got to, in a way, what Bob said, and I suppose Kerry as well, you, you, you've got to treat people and information like that. How would you like, to, how would you like mm. to be treated in that circumstances, in the reverse? 
And we, especially now, we've got so many more important things to be prosecuting and fighting for in a world that's got all sorts of problems. I don't uh, need to, to, to elaborate on those. And, and maybe when we get to the media question, but there was a time when the news was not a profit centre and in the days of Edward Murrow, the, 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 the broadcast, um, the father of, of, mm -hmm. of news broadcasting, and it wasn't about the prurient or the attractive or some minor stupid Hollywood celebrity. It was about news and information. And maybe, guess what? Maybe it was even a little bit boring. But, you know, news is not meant to be entertainment. Well, well let's, let's move on to the, the qu question about the media because it's interesting. Um, how often when I'm talking about ethics and politics, and Bob's right, the intersection from back from the time of Aristotle, ethics was about the good life of the individual. Politics was supposed to be about the good life for a community. Yeah. And you, you hear so many people, who ever, if I ever talk about this, say, oh, but what about the media? What about the media? Yeah. They're actually a serious player, so we'll start with this. So the third question uh, comes from a Labor member for Prospect, Dr Hugh McDermott. Hugh. My question is, how far has commerce corrupted the profession of journalism. Okay. Mm. Well, Peter, he was... In, you just happened to be right in his line of sight, so I might... Me here. <laughs> <laughs> so I might must start with that. Um, and, and Sandra's already been calling for a distinction in our understanding from journalism of the past to what it is at the present. Huge pressure. Has yeah. it corrupted yes. it? Yeah. Well, it depends on the outlet, the masthead and the country. Uh, it's hard to say, for example, that a public broadcaster is subject to you know, commercial corruption because they don't have to earn an income. They get a cheque from the government every year. Uh, there are other outfits. I work for a company that was formerly known as Fairfax, now known as Nine. I can now say that. <laughs> Take a deep breath, Pete. Take thank a deep you, breath. thank you. No trouble at all. Now owned by Nine Entertainment, actually. Um, and there, over... I mean, the, the Sydney Morning Herald is two, nearly two centuries old. The, uh, the, the way that the paper has and continues to deal with the pressure between uh, journalistic honesty and rigour, including turning down all the dirt sheets we get, by the way, on this last question about being offered dirt and, and folios on people. We get dirt sheets every day, 99% uh, of which we just throw in the bin, the other 1% of which produce some pretty interesting stories. Uh, but we, the dividing line between journalistic rigour and commercial pressure uh, is an ancient church and state separation that is enforced both as a matter of corporate policy but also by the journalists uh, who have gone on strike in years past to preserve uh, and create what is called the Charter of Ind Editorial Independence, which guarantees that, that editors and journalists are uh, immune from any pressures from the commercial advertising side of the business. Mm. Other companies uh, don't do that so well. Some companies make a point of not doing that uh, so well. Um, and parliamentary privilege normally would obtain here in, in this chamber, but I don't think it does when the parliament's not sitting and I'm not even an MP. No. So I'm not going to name, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to name names, but there are famously uh, major uh, media outlets uh, in Australia and around the world where the commercial, personal and business interests of the proprietor intrude directly onto the daily content the politicians that they will pursue and hound and persecute and the ones they'll give an easy run to. Mm. Um, all I will, all the, the, the final thing I'll say about that is, uh, that's not us. <laughs> um, uh, before I come to you, Laura, the other, Nick, um, the media are obviously... Well, the narrative from the media often is that they play a vital role as a democracy, the fourth estate. Mm. They are the ones who allow citizens to make informed decisions when it comes time to vote. Mm. How well do you think we're being served by the media today? Oh, I think less well than uh, historically uh, and in, undoubtedly in, in my view. Uh, I think it is a pity. I don't know that it's particularly because of the commercial uh, changes or even the technological changes making it harder to make money in the private media. Uh, I do think uh, more than ever uh, the Australian media is, uh, is in its corner, a bit like society. Um, that applies in the US, it applies in the UK and in many European countries as well. But I think it's sad that you know, you can predict, I can predict what Peter's paper will say on almost any issue and I can predict what 
uh, the Australian or the, broad, or the Herald Sun in Melbourne, you pretty much know where they will go in terms of uh, any issue, either of philosophy or indeed of uh, partisan politics. I think that's a great pity. And I do think my impression is that while conflict has always been uh, an important part of the political process, it seems to me a bit that the, the media, and Laura and Peter will, will have views, the media is very determined to look at issues in a, in a left-right or in a, in a conflict sense, rather than in uh, what is the, the best policy, what are the different features of getting to a policy, what should the opposing views be. So um, I, yeah, I don't think, and it's partly because the diversity of the media has narrowed down a lot, mm. But I think ultimately what worries me is that uh, is the predictability broadly of the media. Uh, we were joking beforehand about what, uh, what Bob watches at night time on uh, political media and it might be different from what I watch. Uh, I just think it's a pity that in this social media sense we've got either complete fragmentation or we've got, in terms of the public media, uh, quite clearly predictable people in their corners, by and large. Yes. So I don't think we're being particularly well served by the media, but uh, I'll finish on this note, Simon. I do think the media reflects the society, as I said in an earlier point, and it reflects social media, where everyone's in their corner basically talking to themselves. I suppose the question that comes to mind is, is it enough that it reflects us if you like, at our average level? Or should we expect politics and the media mm -hmm. to reflect our better selves in some mm -hmm. sense? Something that then, that may sound a little unrealistic, but Laura, we were talking a bit before about what the public is interested in versus the mm -hmm. public interest. There's also a critical distinction that the marketplace tends to give people what they want, yes. whereas the professions serve their interest. So a person walking into a corner shop wanting a block of chocolate, they'll just buy it and they'll get it. If the same person's a diabetic and walks into a doctor's surgery and says, I want the chocolate, they're going to say, no, I know what you want. You mm. can yell as loud as you want, but I'm not going to give you what you want because it's not in your interests that I should do so. It's Is so journalism fair. a profession in that sense that it distinguishes and serves the interests of society or is it just serving up what people want because that's necessary, that's how you get them to watch the channel? Or mm. Well, it's, it's both, to be honest, and that's why you've seen the... Uh, rise of more opinion shows. Um, you look on online uh, at your paper, Peter, or the Australian or the Daily Telegraph, and the opinion uh, columns often have the most comments or are up around some of the most read articles of the day. But there's so many different aspects to this debate. And uh, going back to the original question from Hugh about commerce corrupting journalism, well, on a really basic observational note, I would say that checkbook journalism is no longer as big as it was in the <laughs> 90s and 80s because we simply don't have the money anymore. <laughs> um, so I don't know whether you think that's a good thing or, or a bad thing, but that maybe covers the entertainment as news aspect of things. Um, I think the biggest concern for us at the moment is the Trump effect in Australia. We are, are not immune to the fake news media, um, the attacks on mainstream media um, that have originated from the US president and we kind of see it, it echoed here uh, by you know different individuals and I think that has really undermined professional journalists um, in the information that we're, we're putting out there and more now um, and I have this personally I'm sure Peter does too, more now than ever I find it so important to be Accurate. I mean, that seems like a a, as a pretty basic thing that we need to what be. A reaction against the tendency for people just to say something. Exactly. You know, and and more and more. I mean, we're called upon to give our opinions, and I today I'm here giving my opinion as a journalist. But you really got to separate that opinion and fact. And just one final note I wanted to make in. And while we're talking about cuts to the ABC and this argument about the ABC and kind of these binary ways that different media organisations present the news, and Nick, I, I tend to agree with you in a sense that there is a level of predictability, uh, but uh, for the life of me, I can't understand, coming from the commercial side of things, why we would argue for the ABC to have more taxpayer money stripped away from them. We don't want another uh, outlet competing for what is a, a finite um, amount of uh, commercial money mm. because you know our profits are, are being squeezed as it is. I would argue that the ABC perhaps needs to have its charter changed in many ways and 
the most, the biggest concern I have is for local media, um, local journalists in the bush, uh, in our suburbs, actually holding um, local councillors, whatever level of politician to account. I mean, we're asked to do a lot. Um, and you can see it in the ICAC debate at a federal level, and I've had so many ministers quit. Well, uh, it's a journalist's job. You hold us to account every day. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, that's becoming a lot more difficult than it used to be because we're having to do so much. Bob, I heard a fascinating thing talking about some politics in the US now that truth doesn't matter in the way that it used to, that when <laughs> politicians yeah. speak, they're not expected to signal facts, but la rather in to send a message about their allegiances. So if yeah. someone like President Trump says something, he's sending a signal to his base. This is what I am, I'm with you. Mm. So read that, don't read the truth. But does truth still matter in politics? I think so. I think if, if you stood up, <clears throat> if you've been unfairly attacked and you stand up at a media conference, I think there's enough ethical sense or sense of fairness in the press gallery in Canberra or here mm. to say, well, I think she replied to that. I think she rebutted that. Oh, come on, on the Bob, no. no. seriously, no, based, based on the facts. Don't you think politicians are hounded? And I adopted very it often- It becomes self-fulfilling prophecies though sometimes. Know, that that, that can mean? happen. I'm thinking of the Bridget McKenzie case. I'm thinking of, you know- um, You think she was hounded or? Oh, I, I, I do, yeah, right. I do. I, I, I'm, I'm not making a judgment of whether I think it's right or wrong that she, eventually resigned, um, well that was technically the term, but I think there was a cohort um, within her own party and within the media uh, that decided that that was the end game. This is where it was going to end up. So there becomes, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where there's story after story after story and it becomes... Um, but the media goes hunting for blood in those cases. Well, that, yeah. yeah. Okay, and what, what can, one, do, fed, what can though, one do in those circumstances? My advice to any minister, to any practitioner, would be mobilise the killer fact. Fact against fact, mm. argument against argument. It gives you a better chance of beating a killer pack yeah. mentality. Ability. Yeah. No, but but to, win, <laughs> yeah. to, to win on the facts. And I, I, have seen, I have seen cases where the politician, under attack, subject to groupthink uh, venom, mm. has been able to turn things around by saying these are the facts. But in a sense, there's no greater wisdom on this except the chapter <laughs> in my book. You're not pushing your book, are you? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I don't have to. We, weren't, we didn't require notes. I, I, dedicated, I get dedicated to Sandra because Sandra came into a cabinet meeting saying, it's got to end, it's got to end, end the gotcha moment, the media are out of control. And this, this is what I wrote. Yeah, I, I said, my response, was, my response was, don't waste time on problems that have no solution. Mm. Politicians complaining about the media are acting out one of the world's great cliches. Unfair treatment by the media, like meetings in suburban halls or recruiting members for branches, mm. perhaps I shouldn't have read that, <laughs> Not at the moment. Is, is the price, fairly and ethically and according to the party, is, is the price you pay oh, for a political yeah. career. Yeah. Well, I can't, just, quote, no, I, I, can't quote, I can't quote Bob's uh, book from memory. Oh, oh, yeah. oh good oh, bookshops and online. Oh, f thanks, can I get, get a copy here and Bob can <laughs> autograph it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I didn't bring any of my books, or I could quote from this morning's column, I suppose. Yes, but please do. I don't know, that no, we're mightn't go down so well. Actually. But I have a shorter, I have a shorter quote. Uh, Enid Powell, British politician, who once said, uh, for a politician to complain about the press is like a ship's captain complaining about the weather. Mm. Having said which, two, I'd throw in two thoughts, Simon. One is that all the criticisms of the media, in my view, are absolutely right. Uh, we play gotcha, uh, we play sensationalism. Kingmaker. We play kingmaker. Yep. We play uh, fake news. We do all of that. Yeah. Guilty as charged, yeah. everyone. Yeah. However, I would also say that I think Australia is in a better position uh, journalistically, uh, media-wise, than when I started in the business, when three families and the ABC decided whether an Australian citizen got to know something or not. Mm. So if those three families and the ABC didn't report it, it didn't happen. Mm. Today, it is impossible to do that. Not only do we have formal, obviously the social media, which is a mosh pit of hatred yeah. and anger, yeah. but um, apart from that, we have a much broader range of formal media mastheads, whether it's The Guardian on the left, The Spectator on the right, there are two 24-hour news channels in Australia that we didn't have even 15 years ago, ABC News Channel, Sky News Channel. Uh, 
and a wider range, uh, just a, a much wider range of variety. And that's a great uh, uh, way of cross-checking, mm. censoring each other, checking each other, giving, an, and as I say, impossible now to repress any piece of information. I would also add that we are much better off than the US. Uh, and it demonstrates, did you, you said, Simon, does, does truth matter anymore in politics? <laughs> well, what the US is now is a case study in demonstrating whether that's true or not. Can you spin a virus mm. or not? And I would suggest to you the evidence so far, well, we're going to find out in a few well, months. Let's, let's build on your point, because you do have an excellent... I'll come, I just want to move on, because there's a widen this a little bit. You wrote an excellent column this morning looking at some of the implications to do with the Trump presidency and the alleged briefing in relation to the payment of a bounty to people from the Taliban to kill coalition forces. And that raises a very interesting question about alliances, our position in the world. I'd like to call on the Liberal member for Oatley, Mark Curay, to ask the next question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, does Australia need to be self-sufficient? Mm. Mm. I'll start with you on this, uh, Kerry. This is not just a question about... It is partly to do with self-sufficiency in defence, energy. There's so many different ways. We've seen this with COVID-19. Uh, we've seen the new um, papers being developed by people uh, in the manufacturing sector right throughout. Your, your response? Well, I think COVID has brought all that into very, um, you know, everybody's line of sight. I think at the moment, you know, we kind of were going, oh, we can, we are part of a global economy, we, you know, we've global trade, we've got global defence, all those sorts of things. Uh, we're now starting to question most of that, or a lot of it anyway. Um, I think the most telling thing was our inability to actually provide ourselves with personal protection equipment um, early on, and then you saw a whole lot of Australian companies gearing up to start making masks and things. I think post-COVID, what they're going to do, I think any, all the governments, and I do actually congratulate the National Cabinet. I think the National Cabinet has been working extremely well. I hope it becomes a model for big reform in the future, and I've got a few ideas on what we do need to reform. No one's, I won't put those on out there at the moment, but I do think you know, that National Cabinet will look at what do we need as a nation moving forward? And what is it that we particularly need to be self-sufficient in uh, when it comes to manufacturing, but also um, those alliances, how we work with the rest of the world. I think all of those things will be under review. Um, I have no doubt we will continue with our very strong alliance with the US and our arrangements with the UK, but I do think people will start to question, for example, our economic reliance on perhaps just you know, on China, but can we diversify? Could we, should we be going back and being having stronger relations as we have with places like um, Japan and Korea? Should we be building on those? I think all of that will be a matter of much discussion once we get through the absolute crisis. Um, and I hope, as I said, that that national cabinet will continue and will start to address some of those issues. Sandra? Oh, I feel very strongly about this. And by the way, on PPE, I'd like to know who was responsible for not counting how many masks we didn't have last year before COVID hit the decks and why we had to wait till April before the shipment arrived. And I don't think that any government, Labor or Liberal, state or federal, really got on to an organisation that used to be called the Industrial Supply Office that knew where anything in Australia was made and would have known exactly who to tap on the shoulder and say, can you pivot this way and start making masks? They eventually got onto it, judging by the bragging I saw on TV, but it was very, very late. Um, look, I think we have to have diversity of supply chain inputs and diversity of export markets. I was saying to Peter earlier, it's like having a monoculture. It's great until the locusts come, then, then your whole crop's gone in one, in one uh, fell swoop. I don't, I don't accept jingoistic, oh, you've got to buy, an, buy Australian made. We can't make everything. Consumers voted with their feet. They preferred $7 toasters to paying the full, the full freight. So we have to be careful. We have to scope what is it that we can offer. Now, it's probably in the area of arid climate technologies. There's all sorts of things that the... Have a look at the CSIRO. Have a look at the things they've invented from Wi-Fi to AeroGuard. We have the know-how and the capability in this country, but we have to fund the CSIRO properly. We pro have to fund the co cooperative research centres and we have to fund the research universities, not the teaching universities, but the research universities properly. Because if we're going to go forward and be self-sufficient, we have to pay for it as well. And one way you pay for it is by having a healthy export market, well beyond putting dirt in a box 
and sending it overseas or wool in a box and sending it overseas, which is how we've lived uh, for the last 50 years. So I think innovation's the key and government has to support it. Nick, there's um, traditionally the coalition parties, I think it's fair to say, have been free trade mm -hmm. um, parties. Um, it's varied over the long history of politics, yeah. but that's been its dominant view lately. Do you see that being under some threat now, that commitment to free trade in Australia, that there'll be a populist response to shortages? Um, and I'll come to Bob in a moment on some of the geopolitical issues around mm -hmm. alliances and things like that as well. Um, I don't think it's under serious threat. I certainly hope it isn't under serious threat. The worst thing Australia could do in its own um, long-term self-interest is to lurch, a bit like Mark's question is the, is the good uh, bear pit question, you know, should we be self-sufficient or should we be not? Well, the reality is that we should be doing what I think uh, the National COVID Coordination Commission is doing, which is looking at what areas of industry ought we be working on, and uh, Sandra uh, managed, uh, mentioned a, a few of them. Uh, I think we've what always... What about strategic issues? Though? I mean, hmm? Do you think there are some areas of strategic necessity where we should rebalance to become... Well, I would, uh, I would have thought defence defense manufacturing is an obvious one. Uh, if you're going to spend $200 billion, you're doing it not uh, just for defence of Australia, you're doing it as part of a conscious industry policy. I've got to say, I think Australia has been weak at industry policy, both sides, yeah. for a long time, probably forever. And it does go back to the strength of our, of our natural industry, strength of iron ore and wool and whatever. But uh, we do not do a good job of working out where our competitive advantages are yeah. and how we can help those areas, they're the obvious ones, agribusiness, uh, defence manufacturing, and yet you get the same four, five or six will come up out of Mr Powers' commission. We've never been good at doing anything about it because it's been a bit easy to rely on, uh, on the primary industry. But no, I'd, uh, I'd be horrified, and both politically and practically, if the centre-right... Uh, uh, lurched towards a more uh, protectionist point. The analogue of relying on our natural resources is to have relied on great and powerful friends, whether it was Britain or the United States, Bob. And now I think you see a rising power in China, the United States under its current regime, which is uncertain in its commitment to our region and its allies. What implications do you see for that if this continues to be the general tone of the United States for what Australia needs to do strategically? Yeah, well, first of all, I think we ought to, we ought to refine Mark's question. Um, self-sufficient... So still the Premier. Self-sufficient... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, give self the, give but, the but, answer you want to give to the question that should have been asked. Oh, uh, <laughs> why end the habits of a lifetime? How <laughs> characteristically <laughs> unkind. <laughs> um, oh, but, Bob. Um, but, no, because the, 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 the generalisation irritates me. Yeah. Self-sufficient, more self-sufficient in what? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to. I'm not going to cop lectures from from uh, national politicians from both sides. I think who made a decision to euthanise the Australian car industry. Um, anyone who did that was extinguishing a reservoir of skilled jobs. Mm. There were good reasons that we all, as consensus free traders, understand for making that decision. I'm not going to be lectured by, 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 by members of a, a cabinet or a shadow cabinet who tick that off with how now we've suddenly got to be drawing manufacturing back to Australia. Is, it really, is anyone really suggesting that we start manufacturing running shoes and no. school uniforms no. in Australia? We've moved beyond that. Th there is some other silliness spoken of. Alexander Downer the other day was saying we've got to reduce our reliance on China for medicine. Uh, we'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? We're so dependent on China for medicine. Or India. Or we get 2%. Yeah, I was going to say. We get 2% yeah. of our medicine from China. And I think, I think Mr Blackmore could tell you how well his company has done from exporting food supplements and vitamins to the Chinese market. Mm. Supply, supply goes where the demand is. I can't think of a way around this. And Malcolm Turnbull, when he was confronted with a quote from Hillary Clinton promoting a book, say, five years ago, giving advice to Australians, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Malcolm said, in real wisdom, with real wisdom, well, we're happy to sell our iron ore to Washington, except they've never shown him any interest in buying it. <laughs> of course it makes sense to diversify our trade. Yeah. We ought to be doubling our trade offices 
in India and Indonesia, for example, where rising middle classes will produce demand. But in the meantime, if, if some, if some uh, woman uh, is producing terrific vintages in Mahanta, has sewn up a market with a supermarket, sewn up a, a supply, a 10-year supply of her wine with a supermarket in Shandong, mm. because that's where the demand is for Australian reds, what are we going to do? Send someone from a federal department up to say, now listen, we see you're selling this wine to China. We're worried about our over-dependence on Chinese demand. 40% so in terms, of, in terms of your reframed question about self-sufficiency and yep. what, the strategic areas then, defence, more, more self-sufficiency in defence? Well, what does that mean? Well, We've just made a decision to pay $50 billion, exactly. and it's got likely to be more than that if anything, submarines. on submarines. Yeah. I would have, I'd advocate, having closed down the car industry, I, I, I'd advocate that if we had the opportunity to relive the last 15 years, we might have kept some element of a competitive experimental car industry alive and bought those bloody submarines off the shelf from, Jama J from Japan, Germany or France. That, that would, that's, that's being smarter. Have we got, a ch have we got any in enhanced independence in defence industry from this colossally expensive decision we've made, and a rather fragile decision, to produce the submarines in Adelaide. So do you think we are, put it another way, too reliant on the United States at the moment? We're making too on much defense, of, Yes. Not necessarily. I mean, that, that's something, reliable supplier. Um, where else will we get our fighters? There, there are a bundle of advantages that go with getting the, the fighters and, and warships from the US and there is a competitive tender if Europeans were going to supply us um, with better vessels mm. then they ought to be able to do that. Um, I wouldn't get excited about defence independence but I, but I think common sense, to, to, to revert to Mark's question, I think common sense requires that we have, we have supplies of everything we might require for the next pandemic. I think that's common sense and whether they're stockpiled from domestic suppliers or from overseas purchases, I'd leave that to the experts. Laura, is this, a, is this issue becoming a big one in the public mind, do you think? Yeah, I do, but I think it's populist, and I think mm. to go down an anti-free trade route would be, um, would make us a poorer nation. Um, I think there is an opportunity after COVID though to uh, be uh, more self-sufficient in some areas that make sense. Um, I think everyone is right to say, we're not gonna all of a sudden bob as he said, start manufacturing sneakers or, mm. or, um, or uniforms or start up a big industry in the rag trade. Uh, but we've talked about kind of products and, and manufacturing, but what about people? We have huge skills shortages in so many industries. So I, I hope I'm not um, being pessimistic in my concern is that I hope COVID doesn't leave behind this big class divide in the have and the have nots and the people who have and haven't lost their jobs and those who can get back on their feet. Um, so perhaps there's some uh, jobs that Australians weren't particularly interested in pre-COVID um, that are looking a lot more attractive now. I don't know. Uh, and perhaps it's, that simplifies the issue a lot. But uh, if I could say one last thing on this, and that's the, the climate change debate. Um, I hate to bring up something that's been waging for almost 20 years, but I think we've been, um, and both sides of politics have concentrated a lot on the, um, perhaps the wrong aspect of this debate. Australia's never talked about um, the climate change and renewable energy in terms of from an economic point of view it's always been this social uh, climate point of view and I think we've missed out uh, missed a, a real window here why didn't we ever talk about um, Australia becoming you know the center of these emerging technologies it. and create a new you know business investment uh, framework it's a fascinating thing that Australia unilaterally reduced tariffs Mm. when the rest of the world hadn't did it for economic reasons and yet it hasn't unilaterally done other things. Mm. Look, we've got a last question because you mentioned populism and I'm going to invite the Labor member for Shell Harbour, Anna Watson, to ask the final question as we bring this session to a close. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, panellists. Have, in your view, the practices of politics been broken by representative democracy? Well, has it broken representative democracy? Has it broken democracy? representative oh. democracy? Yeah, ha has the way that politics is done 
given rise now to the kind of populism that you refer to um, and all these other things. Kerry? Uh, well, look, I think the problem is we used to have the 24-hour news cycle and now we've got the 15-minute news cycle, um, you know, because everything that you say or do gets reported, you know, on Twitter, 24-7 television, all that sort of stuff. So I think the way in which poli or the uh, atmosphere in which politicians have to operate is very different. Mm. I mean, I, I joke, um, you used to be able to make a mistake in politics and the media would respect that and they wouldn't actually run it. it you know, that mistake would turn up at the Christmas, you know, the media Christmas party where they'd show all the bloopers. But nowadays it, there is not that respect, right? So I think as a consequence... And everything's live. Well, and that's the problem, everything's live. So, so I think a pro the problem with that is that it means that politics, people try to script politics as tightly as they can so that they don't make mistakes. So as a consequence of that, my view is that you're getting a lot less authenticity in politicians. Um, you know, they, they want to stick to that message as much as they can because they don't want to be you know, suddenly caught out by being asked something they don't know an answer to. So I think as a consequence of that 24-hour, 24-7 news cycle, people aren't as authentic. And as a consequence of that, I think that politics is now much more of a game it's not just about representing your communities. It's not just about decisions. It's about how you play that game and the people who play it best. So that becomes a question of who are the best media performers. And, you know, we've got... And I'm not going to name anyone to your point, Peter. I'm not protected by privilege. Um, there are some people who are fantastic media performers who are politicians, right? But do we think they're really the right people to be, you know, taking leads in all those debates? Not necessarily but they do get a really good crowd, they get good people, they get fantastic Twitter response. And I think that's been a problem for real representative democracies. Nick, how healthy do you think our representative democracy is at the moment? How healthy do you think our representative democracy? I think it, uh, it lacks a focus on the public interest. I think it has, an, it's perhaps a version of what Kerry just said. I think our representative democracy is really about winning in a political sense these days, rather than about uh, reform. I mean, it's a bit simple perhaps to say there's policy and politics, and of course the two interact. But I think around the world, there are very few reformist governments of the left or the right. It isn't an ideological thing. And I think that is a uh, result of some of the, uh, some of the things that, uh, that Kerry was talking about. So I don't think our representative democracy is serving us particularly well, but I do think, to uh, pinch someone else's line, uh, it is better than any alternative. <laughs> and there is a real obligation, I think, on, the, on all of us and all the different stakeholders to make the representative democracy function better for the public interest. The notion that somehow, and it's happening a bit in the States, you can go around representative democracy uh, and get better results, I think is There, there are unlikely. lots of people who may not put it in these terms who feel that essential promises were, were broken in the past, that the citizen was at the centre of the state. I made the observation over lunch to someone that now we don't even refer to citizens. Governments typically refer to them as customers, as if the relationship is mm. one of transactions, and which diminishes the citizen in some sense. Yep. The market hasn't really delivered the increase in stock of common good for everyone as it's supposed to have done. Bob, is populism, do you think, a threat, a, a genuine threat now, or do you think that the system will correct itself and not take some of the more extreme lines that could possibly be followed? Well, you've got to focus on the US and on Europe. Italy is now dominated by two populist parties, the League and the Five Stars Movement. And the Five Stars Movement, which is leading the government at the present time, last time I checked, it changes with lightning speed in Rome, <laughs> is, is always advertising the fact that we haven't held jobs in politics. We're the amateurs. They're making a virtue of that. Um, and the choice is between them and the somewhat racist-tinged Liga. So don't tell me the established party system can't collapse. It's collapsed in, Fra it collapsed in France and there are interesting pressures in Germany with uh, AFD and the growth in the green vote and the diminution of what inspired me in my 30s, the, the best Labour or Social Democrat Democratic Party in the world, the German Social Democrats. I mean, so this is real and it's roaring through Europe destroying, devouring the old party political systems. I think, I think the, uh, the party system here has been more robust 
The two-party system in the US has been remarkably strong, although the Republican Party has dramatically changed its character. Mm. Very and, brief. And I suppose that's the, the resting place here in answering your question. Before we wind up, because we are out of time, Sandra, briefly a comment for you about your optimism. It goes back to not. media, though I don't blame the practitioners. When I got pre-selected in 87, I was media trained for news grabs 10 to 15 seconds. When I left 19 years later, it was five to seven seconds. Mm. How do you get complexity across in that time? Yeah. You don't get, if you don't convey complexity, you lose the people. Then you've got the keyboard warriors. Then you've got the, I won't use the, uh, I won't use the word I really want to use, those people who effectively run around saying we're not politicians, like mm. I started saying off in the first question. It is the most egregious like who, lie. Like who, people. people who say we're not politicians. And we had a few of them sitting here. You'd remember them, mm, Nick. I do uh, remember them. Who say we're they not politicians. They were very politi kind to me. Oh. <laughs> they make a virtue out of so, claim, so, the anti-politician. So, so that, that's the problem. So no, look, no one's hands are clean in what's happened. Politicians have, have danced to the tune that says, I need to get some media. Because no matter how good we are, if we stand on the corner enunciating a great policy, if it's not picked up in the press, what's it matter? So we have to dance to that tune. And in so doing, we've sold our souls a bit and we've become a bit of media tarts. But nevertheless... What's happened is that in five to seven seconds, you can't look for real, you do not look genuine, and you start to lose the populace. And Particularly you if you're using talking points for everything. Yeah, you and say. if you lose the populace, then it, it's <laughs> We're, we're going to have to bring this to an downward end. Downward spiral. I thought that we'd have plenty of time for five solid questions. It turns out it wasn't <laughs> enough time. There's a lot of nuance here that should be explored, and I hope that we'll have a chance to do something like this again. One of the most famous essays ever written about politics is by Max Faber, in which he actually argues the case that there should be the professional politician, mm. somebody who's got the skill to manage the pursuit and exercise of power, but they never need to lose their authenticity. And I think the issue is how do you get these two things to go? So that to take the point that I think you made, Nick, it genuinely is a contest of ideas in the public interest rather than simply to win for its own mm. sake. That may seem a bit naive, but I, I wonder... Hey, Pollyanna. Pollyanna, you think so? Oh, I nowadays, think so. I think. That's where it used to be. I'm not sure it is now. Oh, well, there's never been a golden age, of course, but maybe we can aim for something better. Look, I'd just like to bring this to a conclusion now. I'd like to thank Laura Jays, Kerry Chikorovsky, Bob Carr, Nick Reiner, Sandra Norrie and Peter Harcher very much for being this and the people who posed the questions and from the Legislative Assembly here in the Parliament of New South Wales, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.